I became middle class in 1975. <laughs> it's, it's weirdly specific, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm the child of boomers. The interesting thing about the baby boomer generation is you had all of these working class families whose ancestors had been perfecting the art of peasantry for centuries. <laughs> And then they suddenly decided, you know what, uh, let's try being middle class for a change. <laughs> they were rooted, rooted in poverty since the Middle Ages, and then all of a sudden, boom, golf club membership and avocado on toast. <laughs> it happened straight away. You'll know what I'm talking about if your mum had that special telephone voice. You know, the... the yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, oh, hello there. <laughs> Like the Queen of England had possessed her body every time the rotary phone rang. Most of the time she's like, get your muddy shoes off the carpets! And then the phone rings, oh, Margaret, how divine to hear from you. <laughs> so uh, I became middle class in 1975 because that is when my sister Claire was born. I say born, more likely adopted directly from Downton Abbey. She spent most of her days with her school friends sort of preparing for next weekend's dressage competition. Whilst me and my mates played that classic childhood game of who can jump off the highest story of an abandoned building. <laughs> or a full 11 v 11 football match with an empty can of coke. Claire spoke like she was perpetually addressing Parliament. Right? <laughs> and I spoke like Ray Winston auditioning for a Guy Ritchie film. <laughs> yeah. When you're in this sort of class transition, you don't really fit in anywhere. Your working class mates, they, they look at you like you're too posh every time you say dinner instead of tea. Oh, listen to Lord Fontor over there with his dinner. <laughs> Actual middle class kids, they'd look at you like you had a dead rat hanging out your pocket every time you said settee instead of sofa. When you're sort of class homeless, you know, you don't really fit in anywhere. You're too rough for the cul-de-sac and you're too fancy for the council estate. So. In this situation, when you're in this kind of class limbo, nowhere hits harder than a museum. My friend in the front row here just pointed out that museums are amazing places. <laughs> um. <laughs> museums are amazing places. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> They're amazing places, but s some of them, some of them make you feel like you've just wandered into someone else's private club. They're weird spaces to be in a lot of the time. You know, I, I, you know I'm in a museum and everyone else is looking at everything like, like they know what it all means, and I'm looking at this kind of pottery shard, thinking, what, I don't know what's so special about this. So, so the ancient Greeks dropped a bit of crockery, so do the modern Greeks, particularly at weddings. It's the same feeling you get when someone asks your opinion about wine. Uh, and you don't know anything about wine. So you say, should, should I say the word Malbec? Because I heard that once before. Is it Malbec or Malbec or Malbec? Mablec? It's probably not Mablec. That's not. Um, uh, I'll have a glass of Savignog Blanc, please. In truth, my favourite wine is the, th is the one that comes in the three litre box. It's, it's because it's stackable. Uh, and that's important to me because I can't afford a wine rack. So in a museum, I feel like I'm, I'm being judged for not being able to fill in the intellectual blanks, whilst posh people are gliding through with the casual confidence of someone who has a Rembrandt hanging up in the bathroom at home. So it's either irony or destiny that, of course, I ended up working for a museum. And I love working for a museum, but I still appreciate that for millions of people, these places, these buildings, these exhibitions feel like maybe they're not made for them. When I was growing up, avoiding museums like there were self-assessment tax returns, <laughs> I didn't realise but I was living and breathing a history that really did mean something to me. My grandma's war stories, her memories, her photographs, the war memorials that I walked past. I walked past one, it's got my name on, my name on it, not my actual name, my surname, kind of engraved in the front. Am I related to this person who probably died in some muddy ditch in Belgium? And I start to think about what the person might have gone through. I start to think maybe the answer to that question isn't so important. But it is. This isn't a pottery shard, it's a personal connection. Those stories, those personal items, those names engraved into the stone, they're all history. But somehow they're not considered museum worthy, they're mostly not collected or interpreted. The truth is, if you try to give a museum your diary or artefact, they probably won't take it.
Museums have a massive storage problem. There are warehouses and aircraft hangars packed full of boxes of objects. It's like that building they're trying to stick the Ark of the Covenant in at the end of that Indiana Jones movie. It's why we don't open any of the big boxes anymore, not since Brian melted. When you try to give a museum your grandfather's photograph album, they're not going to take that. They're probably not going to take it. It's not going to get accessioned into a collection. Not unless it fills a gap in a narrative, one of a hundred stories a museum can tell out of a million that it probably can't. Whilst refusing these objects solves a storage problem, it creates a whole new one. Who is making room for new perspectives and new stories? Maybe AI can help. Imperial War Museums has over 11 million images in its collection. Many of them were gathered decades ago and don't have a lot of use of information or descriptions. Some of them have no uh, description at all. In fact, one of them is a photograph that simply has the word photograph written on the back, <laughs> right? So if you need a photograph, don't worry, we, we've got one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Imperial War Museums uh, is now using AI in the form of computer vision and large language models to help us to understand what's in these images. In fact, we've been doing it for a while. Uh, eight years ago, uh, given an image of a Spitfire, the app would tell us with about 80% certainty that that is probably an aircraft. Fast forward to today, it'll tell us exactly which of the 24 different marks of Spitfire it is, along with a nice detailed description of the history of that mark. With AI, the pace of change is incredible. But how can AI help us tell bigger, more rounded stories? Our challenge moves from beyond understanding what we have into understanding what we don't. In a collection gathered many years ago, a lot of the images don't really tell much of a story at all. But the ones that do often tell the same narrow story. It's a white middle class Western story. Like a movie of the world filmed from one camera through one lens in just one spot. Often we only tell one side of a story because it's the only side that we have. The problem is, in war and conflict, whilst the minimum number of sides is two, the maximum is almost infinite. I don't know if you're familiar with the book Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. It's a great book. It tries to cover 70,000 years of human history in just 512 pages. What I'm saying is it's missing some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> One presumes he had a deadline. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> it's not a criticism of Harari or museums, but for every moment in history covered by a book or a museum, 99.9% .9 of the stories go untold. There's kind of no other way to do it. It has to be a sort of necessarily fleeting overview from a narrow collection of perspectives. But the perspectives that can and should be covered when asking and answering questions about war and conflict are vast. There are hundreds of millions more images in boxes, in basements and hard drives across the world that remain uncollected by any museum. These could tell these stories from a myriad of perspectives and help us to understand our past. But AI isn't exposed to any of that material and it won't be part of the story that AI tells. So what if we, what if all of us could contribute our families' war stories, our memories, our photographs to help train AI? AI can link information together, help us find new connections, it enables discovery and participation from people of all backgrounds across the globe. But in the age of AI, it gives rise to misinformation, hallucinations, and sometimes even a refusal to talk about war altogether. Large language models love certainty. You'll have seen the confidence with which it answers your questions. But war is full of uncertainty. So the quality of the data and the insight we use to train AI is critical. It's crucial that AI delivers answers that reflect the nuance and perspective required to truly understand it. AI is powerful. It's powerful. Okay? And it can help us to understand conflict. But our challenge is more human than that. Today, understanding the causes of war, the rise of authoritarianism, the possible consequences, and the impact on people is more important than ever. Technology can help us build that understanding. But we'll never achieve anything if we do it in spaces where people feel they don't belong, where we're not telling their stories. 
AI can accelerate this change, but this is really about humans. Museums need to be able to engage with everyone, from recruitment of staff and volunteers to collecting and interpretation. Enabling contributions and collaboration from the widest range of people is the key to teaching both humans and AI about history. It is what will make humans more human and artificial intelligence more intelligent. But if we're going to communicate a better understanding of history, we also need to be able to do what AI can't. How can we tell more human stories, use more human relatable language? How can we create more joy in engaging with our past? How can we allow ourselves to maybe tell jokes, and dare I say, be funny? Because AI isn't the only thing that creates connections. Joy and laughter create human connections which can build a sense of belonging, which can help create a sense of community, which enable shared knowledge, knowledge that's for everyone and from everyone. Thank you.